Big decisions require research. So if your teenager is considering a decision as big as joining the military, they're doing their homework. You can too, by visiting todaysmilitary.com because their success tomorrow begins with your support today. This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 128, for broadcast on the 20th of November, 2022. Coming up on Space Time, Orion's historic journey around the moon, scientists find a field full of meteorites from an asteroid explosion over South Australia, and China's aggressive confrontation with the Philippines to steal space junk debris from a Chinese rocket. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Artemis 1 Orion spacecraft has arrived safely in lunar orbit. It's now well into its distant retrograde orbit, which will take the mission some 92,195 kilometres beyond the Moon, further than any other human-rated spaceship. The orbit's called distant in the sense that it's high in altitude above the lunar surface, and it's retrograde because Orion will be travelling around the Moon in the opposite direction to the way the Moon travels around the Earth. It's a highly stable orbit that requires very little fuel to maintain. Last Monday, Orion swooped to within just 129 kilometres of the lunar surface before streaking out to its new distant retrograde orbit. The manoeuvre saw Orion travel behind the Moon as seen from Earth, resulting in the expected loss of signal with NASA's Deep Space Communications Network for about 34 minutes. And the signal was reacquired as expected as soon as the Earth came back into view. During its mission, Orion undertakes numerous course correction engine burns. They're designed to keep it pointing in the right direction, and there are some longer orbital insertion burns designed to move the spacecraft into and out of its distant retrograde lunar orbit. So far, the data is showing that Orion's used a lot less fuel than expected, and all spacecraft systems are continuing to operate nominally. In fact, the only drama for the mission so far was a sudden unexpected loss of signal for 47 minutes between Mission Control and Artemis 1. That was last Thursday. The dropout happened just as NASA's Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, Texas, was reconfiguring the communications link between Orion and the Deep Space Network. The issue was quickly resolved and the spacecraft remains in a healthy configuration. Engineers are now analysing the data to determine exactly what the cause was. Meanwhile, there has been a little bit of drama with one of the CubeSats launched by the Artemis 1 mission. NASA's Lunar H Map CubeSat, which was designed to measure the distribution and abundance of hydrogen and, by extension, water ice in the Moon's south polar region, failed to perform a crucial manoeuvre as planned. The CubeSat was supposed to undertake an engine burn during its lunar flyby, but it failed to do so, most likely because of a stark valve in its propulsion system. Mission managers are still hoping to salvage the 10 CubeSat water hunting mission because Lunar HMAP's other systems all appear to be functioning nominally, and heating the valve might well free it, bringing the propulsion system back online. There are 10 other CubeSats on the mission that are all deployed from the SLS's upper stage following separation of the Orion spacecraft after it left Earth orbit. They're all performing nominally. The 25-and-a-half-day Artemis 1 mission is considered the final test for the Orion spacecraft and SLS launch system, which will carry humans back to the Moon in two years' time and return people to the lunar surface in 2025. Orion will also form part of the spacecraft, which will eventually take people onto Mars and beyond. But that won't be for at least another decade or so. This is Space Time. Still to come... Scientists find a field of meteorites from an asteroid explosion over South Australia, and NASA's planetary defence team successfully predicts an asteroid impact. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists have discovered one of the largest meteorite-strewn fields in Australia. 
the six kilometre long ellipse fall zone, located north of the outback South Australian town of Port Augusta, was created by the airburst of a large meteor about one and a half metres wide back on July the 31st, 2013. That airburst was originally detected by US Department of Defense satellites as an unusually large atmospheric explosion, equivalent to approximately 220 tonnes of TNT. However, details were only made public recently after the United States began releasing bolide event details from their archives. So, nine years after the six-ton asteroid crashed through Earth's upper atmosphere, scientists using a combination of satellite data, weather radars and drones began searching the strewn field looking for fragments of the doomed space rock. And over just a few days, they found more than 44 small meteorites. The field team, led by Professor Andy Tompkins from Monash University School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment, found their first samples just 10 minutes after arriving at the site. Tompkins and colleagues have now gathered over 4 kilograms of meteorite samples and have commenced the process of studying and evaluating their finds. He says the discovery is exciting because it's the first meteor-strewn field resulting from a new fall event to be defined since the famous Murchison meteorite fall in Victoria back in 1969. Back in mid-2013, a six-ton asteroid basically uh, hit the Earth's atmosphere, moving at about 20 kilometres a second and exploded and showered the ground with lots and lots of meteorites. And basically what's happened is defence satellites have picked up the explosion and sometime later that data has been released to the public and then the guys at Curtin University, led by Hadrian Devobois, have used that information to, to, to try and track down the place on the ground to go and hunt these down. And then we've basically gone out to the place and walked around in the, in the desert and picked them up. Now, I know that Sopwish country pretty well. How did you find them? This is not like finding a meteorite in Antarctica where the black rock sticks out against the white background of the snow or even in the Sahara Desert where, again, the black meteorite sticks out against the yellow sands. This is um, this has got to be a more difficult job. Yeah, it's a bit trickier. So you're kind of largely right, though. It's a, it, they are black rocks. Because they're newly fallen meteorites, they tend to have quite a dark, almost black surface. And there aren't very many rocks that are that sort of distinctive black colour that meteorites have when they're really, really fresh. So in this particular case where it happened to be this time, there was some sand, the usual red sort of coloured sand of the Australian outback, a bit of grass around and that sort of thing, which makes life harder, some shrubbery. And there were lots of small rocks around too. And so a lot of the small rocks just happened to be sort of tan coloured, light brown coloured. So there weren't very many black rocks around at all. So picking out the meteorites amongst all the brown rocks wasn't too hard. The tricky bit though was there's lots of kangaroo poo and a bit of sheep poo around the place as well, which made they all look like meteorites, so that made life a little bit harder. wasn't too bad. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, I'm sure you would have <laughs> known the difference as soon as you touched it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the meteorites aren't as squishy. Yeah. You found a fair few of them. Tell, tell me about it all. Yeah, so we've got 44 meteorites so far, and they sort of come from what we call a, a strewn field, which is kind of like a, an ellipse-shaped region on the ground where the meteorites are scattered after the explosion in the atmosphere. So we basically went out there and, started to walk a grid across the area and then we started finding meteorites and then everything, our planned grid sort of went a bit chaotic and everybody started wandering around everywhere picking up meteorites. It was just too much fun. So it hasn't been fully searched out yet. What we've done is kind of um, gone in there with drones too to try and make it a bit easier for ourselves as well. So yes, 44 meteorites so far, a lot still to find probably. It's going to be interesting to see how well the drone technology helps us really refine things as we keep going back there to try and find some more. On average, uh, average being a, uh, a subjective word, I guess, what size are they? Yeah, so the biggest one we found so far is about as big as your fist, and the smallest one is maybe about a couple of centimetres across. Um, we expect there to be some bigger ones out there still, so you know, uh, maybe the size of your head type, type size measure is about as big as they're likely to be out there. Most of them are probably sort of half the size of your fist or maybe a bit smaller than that. So yeah, that sort of range so far. We'll see how we go with finding a few more. Back in 2013, when, when the actual airburst took place, did anyone report it? Or was it just a place so far away from what we call civilization that no one actually noticed it? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. So obviously the defence satellites picked it up, like I said before, but I would imagine some people would have seen it. But what did pick it up was the weather radar system. And so once we had seen the, that there was a big explosion in the NASA data. Hadrian went along and looked at the weather radar data and was able to, to spot the level in the atmosphere where the radar actually picked up the meteorites coming through 
the atmosphere. And that helped him triangulate on the ground where the best place would be to go and look for it. So it was actually the weather radar that recorded it probably the first and helped us the most. And it was, it was Hadrian's work calculating where on the ground they would be as, as a result of that that led us to the right place. Was the Desert Fireball Network set up at that time? Yeah, so this was actually just before the Desert Fireball Network got set up properly. So we, did, we weren't able to use the fireball cameras at that point. This was kind of the case of just being able to use the, the weather radar. And in the future, what we hope we have, we'll be able to do is to use the weather radar and the fireball cameras to sort of refine the tra- trajectory even better than we can just with the cameras alone to figure out where it came from in the, in the solar system. So figure out the orbital location in the solar system, where it came from. Yeah, that's what we're hope, hoping will happen going forward. You'd be able to tell some of that from the shape of the ellipse on the ground. You'd, you'd have a rough idea, wouldn't you? Yeah, we, we did. Actually, Hadrian did actually calculate the orbital origin for this, but uh, the amount of error on the, using the approach of just using the weather radars was produced a little bit of an unrealistic orbit. We think it probably came from somewhere in the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter, but the orbit calculated was a little bit beyond Jupiter, so probably a little bit out. What sort of meteorites are they? Uh, we've had a look with the microscope and the electron microprobe already. And it looks like a, a H5 ordinary chondrite, which means it's a fairly common type of meteorite. Lots and lots of metal in it, so it's a type of stony meteorite. Type of stony meteorite, lots of metal. They're quite magnetic and lots of little chondrules in them. Probably the research we're doing on it is not to do so much with what the meteorite can tell us about the early solar system in this particular case, but a few other interesting things like little bits of metal, bits of little, little bits of iron sulfide, and minerals like olivine and pyroxene as well. They're fairly typical of what a, a, a normal stony meteorite looks like. So where are we at now? What's happening? What's happening? Now. Yeah, so in this last trip we went out there, we took uh, some drones with us. So Seamus Anderson from Curtin University has been doing research on using drones to speed up the meteorite hunting process. So what happens is he, he takes the drones, flies it over and over the area in a grid pattern and takes thousands of photographs of the area from, from there. And then from the resulting thousands of the photographs, he uses artificial intelligence to search through the photographs from meteorites. And the, the program goes through and picks out meteorites and gives the searches targets to go and follow up on. So basically, it, it should cut down the time for searching by a lot. It might take days and days and days to search out know, at a hunting area for many people, whereas this might gives you targets straight away. You just walk straight to the meteorite, basically. So it's pretty exciting. That's Professor Andy Tompkins from Monash University's School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment. And this is Space Time. Still to come... NASA's Punisher Defense Team successfully predicts an asteroid impact. China's aggressive confrontation with the Philippines to steal a piece of space junk. And later in the science report, scientists finally work out why people get fluffy floaties and stinky sinkies. Yes, we're going there. All that and more still to come on Space Time. In the early hours of Saturday, November the 19th, the skies over southern Ontario, Canada suddenly lit up as a tiny metre-wide meteor streaked across the sky high in the Earth's atmosphere and broke apart, scattering into dozens of small meteorites over the southern coastline of Lake Ontario. Now, small asteroids like this hit the Earth's atmosphere all the time. But what makes this one special is that it's only the sixth space rock to have been successfully detected in space and identified as a potential Earth impactor before it hit. The meteor, catalogued as 2022 WJ1, was detected by NASA's Scout Impact Hazard Assessment Team three and a half hours before the impact. NASA is tasked with the detection and tracking of much larger near-Earth objects which could survive passage through the Earth's atmosphere, causing damage on the ground. But those objects can usually be detected much further in advance than small ones like the asteroid that disintegrated over southern Ontario. Now these small asteroids are not really a hazard to Earth, but they can be a useful test of NASA's planetary defence capabilities for discovery, tracking, orbit determination and impact prediction. Near-Earth Object Observations Program Manager Kelly Fast from NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office says the event demonstrates response readiness for short warning events. These harmless impacts become spontaneous real-world exercises, allowing NASA's Planetary Defense System to test its capabilities in the event a larger, more dangerous asteroid presents itself. It's a fascinating story. The asteroid was first discovered by the NASA-funded Catalina Sky Survey, which is run by the University of Arizona in Tucson. 
The detection was made during routine search operations for near-Earth objects. The observations were then quickly reported to the Minor Planet Center. That's an internationally recognized clearinghouse for the position measurements of small celestial bodies. And that coordinate data was then automatically posted to the Near-Earth Object Confirmation page. NASA's Scout Impact Hazard Assessment System, which is maintained by CENEOS, the Center for Near-Earth Object Studies, at the agency's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, then automatically retrieved that new data and began calculating the object's possible trajectory and its chance of impact. CENEOS calculates every known near-Earth asteroid orbit in order to provide assessments of potential impact hazards in support of NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office. And so just seven minutes after the asteroid was posted on the confirmation page, Scout had already determined it had a 25% probability of hitting the Earth's atmosphere, with possible impact locations stretching from the Atlantic Ocean off the east coast of North America all the way down to Mexico. More observations were then provided by the astronomical community, including citizen scientist astronomers in Kansas. These better define the celestial coordinates of asteroid 2022 WJ1, its trajectory, and its possible impact location. Small objects like this can really only be detected once they're fairly close to the Earth, so if they're headed for an impact, time is of the essence to collect as many observations as possible. And this object was discovered early enough for the planetary defence community to provide more detailed observations, which scout their news to confirm that there would be an impact with Earth and predict where and when the asteroid was going to hit. As Catalina continued to track the asteroid over the next few hours, Scout used this new data to continuously update the asteroid's trajectory and the system's assessment of the chance of impact, posting those results on the Hazard Assessment System's webpage. Many astronomers check the Scout webpage throughout the night in order to determine the most important asteroids to track. And a group of citizen scientist astronomers at the Farpoint Observatory in Kansas decided to track the asteroid for more than an hour, providing crucial additional data that enabled Scout to confirm with 100% accuracy the impact probability and where and when the location of atmospheric entry would take place, that being over southern Ontario at 3.27 a.m. With still more than two hours remaining before the impact, there was lots of time to alert scientists in the southwestern Ontario region of the bright fireball that was about to occur. Some 46 observations of the asteroid's position were ultimately collected, the final one being only 32 minutes before impact by the University of Hawaii's 2.2-metre telescope upon Mauna Kea. Then right on time as predicted at 3.27am, asteroid 2022 WJ1 streaked through the Earth's atmosphere in a shallow angle, breaking apart and likely producing a shower of small meteorites, but leaving no reported damage on the ground. Dozens of sightings were reported to the American Meteor Society, and scientists who were alerted to the scout prediction were able to photograph the asteroid's atmospheric entry. Videos of the fireball collected by the public were also posted online and NASA's Meteorite Falls website also reported weather radar detections. Now, as we said at the top of the story, this was only the sixth time that an asteroid was observed in space which was predicted to eventually hit the Earth. The first asteroid to be discovered and tracked well before hitting the Earth was 2008 TC3, which entered the atmosphere over Sudan and broke up in October 2008. That was a 4-metre-wide asteroid which scattered into hundreds of small meteorites over the Nubian Desert. The last to be detected prior to the Ontario event was earlier this year when asteroid 2022 EB5 entered the Earth's atmosphere over the Norwegian Sea, scout accurately predicting its location and time of impact. Of course, all these things are happening in the Northern Hemisphere. South of the equator, there is still no comparable asteroid detection and warning system. A Chinese Coast Guard vessel has twice blocked a small Philippine Navy rubber patrol boat before forcibly seizing a large piece of space junk debris believed to have come from a Long March 5B rocket which had fallen to Earth in Filipino territory. Chinese naval vessels have been harassing these small Filipino supply boats in the South China Sea for years, but stealing material in possession of another nation constitutes a far more brazen act by the ruthless Beijing government. This confrontation in Filipino waters is the latest in a growing list of heated disputes between Beijing and its neighbours, including the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Japan and Taiwan. 
the metal debris at the centre of the confrontation, was just one of numerous pieces of space junk from a Chinese Long March 5B rocket, which had launched back on July the 24th, carrying the final module of Beijing's Tiangong, or Heavenly Palace, space station. The problem is, China deliberately allow their Long March 5B rockets to fall back to Earth in a chaotic, uncontrolled re-entry. Unlike other nations which control the descent of their rockets, targeting a region known as Point Nemo in the southeastern Pacific Ocean, well away from populated areas and trade routes. Because of the chaotic nature of the Chinese re-entries, rocket debris can come down pretty well anywhere. Previous Chinese Long March 5B rocket debris has plummeted back to Earth, landing in the Maldives, Borneo, and on several villages in the Ivory Coast. The Philippine Navy says Chinese space junk has been discovered in Philippine territory on at least three separate occasions. The Philippine government has sent a letter of protest to Beijing over this latest incident, telling reporters they won't let China trample over Philippine maritime rights. The Philippines and other nations in the region have repeatedly protested over China's increasingly aggressive stance in the area. In response, the United States, Australia, Canada and the United Kingdom have deliberately taken their warships and military aircraft through the region under international freedom of navigation laws in defiance of often shrieking threats by Beijing. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. It's been revealed that 80% of Australia's total COVID-19 death toll has occurred since the Omicron variant took over as the dominant strain. The findings by the Australian Bureau of Statistics show that the rate of COVID-19 related deaths in which COVID-19 was reported as the cause of the death had fallen by 72% by August 2022 compared with 99% in the first year of the pandemic. But the report says a high proportion of Australian-born people are now dying of the virus in Australia and what happened during the Delta wave where Australians born overseas were dying at four times the rate of those born locally. Meanwhile, COVID-19 cases across Australia are rising again as the fourth wave of the disease begins to sweep across the nation. More than 6.6 million people have been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it was first detected near China's Wuhan Institute of Virology around September 2019. The World Health Organization, however, says the true death toll is likely to be over 15 million, with some 650 million confirmed cases globally. And the Lancet Commission, a panel of world-leading experts in policy and disease management, estimate around 18 million people have now died because of COVID-19. For years, scientists have been warning expectant mothers that smoking during pregnancy is known to have a detrimental effect on the unborn child. Now, a report in the Journal of the American Medical Association says taking vitamin C could at least help decrease those effects on their children's airways. The study's authors provided pregnant smokers with a 500 mg daily dose of vitamin C or a placebo and then followed up with their kids at age 5. They found that children of mothers who were given the supplemental vitamin C had much better lung function than those given the placebo. Additionally, kids in this group who were also given vitamin C had a significantly decreased wheeze, a common issue for the kids of mums who smoked during their pregnancy. Scientists at the Mayo Clinic have discovered why some people's bowel movements are, well, let's call them fluffy floaties, while others are stinky sinkies. The findings published in the journal Scientific Reports shows that rather than the fat content as originally thought, it's actually the gas content in faecal matter that determines its buoyancy. The findings are based on trials with healthy human subjects, and they showed that the difference was due to the amount of gas in a given faecal sample. The authors also found that the stool gas content was directly related to the makeup of the microbiome in the intestinal tract. In the Australian state of New South Wales, the health watchdog, the HCCC or Health Care Complaints Commission, has been given new powers to shut down alternative medical practices, people like naturopaths and chiropractors. 
this places these operators under the same controls as conventional doctors and medical centres comes in the wake of increasing levels of complaints by patients about alternative medicine practices, which had previously snuck in under the carpet. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the new regulations simply put anyone who's practising what they call healthcare under the same scrutiny. Well, the New South Wales Healthcare Complaints Commission, which is the HCCC, is basically the consumer affairs government body in New South Wales that looks at complaints about practitioners, both traditional evidence-based and uh, alternative. And what's happened in the past is that with a lot of these alternative practitioners, we're talking naturopaths, chiropractors, various sort of alternative treatments, when a practitioner is doing something wrong. A lot of these actually have recently have, have applied to cosmetic surgeons who are really out there sort of making all sorts of claims. But it could apply to a whole range of alternative treatments. When the practitioner is doing something wrong, the HCCC can come down on, on them like a ton of bricks. But what they're now saying and what's sort of recently being brought in is that the whole clinic where they work, if they are working in a clinic, can be charged or found not complying with its code of conduct. And the code of conduct is about treating patients properly. It's about safety. It's about health and safety issues, infection control, all sorts of things like that, even, even possibly whether it works, but certainly about the stamp of approval that this clinic is clean. If one practitioner within your clinic is doing something wrong, the whole clinic can be found at fault. So this is probably a way to make sure that for clinics to make sure that none of their practitioners are actually breaking the codes of practice. Now this applies to traditional evidence medicine as well, it applies to you know applies to all sorts of individuals, but it's basically saying that for the alt med areas, the clinic cannot just pass it by and say, well, that's just that one practitioner, that's the bad apple within the clinic. No, the, the clinic has to apply some pretty decent checks and balances to make sure that the people who work there are actually doing the right thing. Sometimes clinics are actually made up of individual uh, business people. They're not sort of like a, they're lot like a, a, a business with separate little businesses within them. Yeah, so, a lot of medical centres are like that these days. Yeah, and this is the case where they, the whole clinic, the ones who say, yep, you can sort of work here within our premises, have to be responsible for what's happening as well. So it's a good thing because you can't just get away with one person and say the rest of it is okay. It's just a partnership, really. It's just what happens with a lot of uh, businesses. The accounting practices and things are often partnerships and you have to be responsible for everyone else. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 